Smashy brings you the latest in Web3 technology, art, and pop culture. And that's why Smashy is at Gary B's VCon, where the latest in Web3 and pop culture. Web3 encompasses NFTs, crypto, blockchain, and what it is known as the second generation of the internet. Pop culture goes into music, art, movies we watch, TV shows, who our idols are. So combining these two is so much fun if you're into technology and the impact of technology and into pop culture, music, art, and so on. This is why Gary V's VCon is a key conference for you to participate in in the years ahead. I'm walking around VCon. Yes. And the image I'm getting in my mind is young Gary uh, walking through his neighborhood. The your interests, which are the collectibles, the gaming, the wrestling, and so on. So, and I also see the mom and the dad as well. So there's a lot of young Gary from your content that we all consume. Is that the intention? That's the vibe I got. I think it's a great observation. Not only is it young Gary, it's the whole thing. Like my parents and sister are here. AJ was here, but then my best friend Robbie growing up, and then Brandon, and then my college friends. I, I do sense, and you know, to be frank, it wasn't so planned. I wasn't so sold that my college friends were gonna be here, or didn't know if my sister could come, but when I look at what's transpiring here, I do think there's a culmination of my journey. I think VFriends is a culmination of my journey, and yeah, I think that's a really smart observation. Um, the concept of and and or, you spoke a lot of, uh, uh, about it a lot on, uh, on your content and also on stage in your opening keynote. Uh, I'd like to go more into this. I know the or is for people who, who draw lines in the sand, but this is not for me. I did that mistake with, with VFriends uh, 1. I was following you on, so, uh, on, the, on, the, on the business side. Yes. When you skewed into that, I did the mistake of saying, it's, yeah. not, it's not for me, I don't know what it is. Yeah. And, and, then, and then I corrected. Within a year, I'm, I, I'm here, I'm starting projects in this. So, I'm proud uh, of you. Uh, thank you for that's, that. That's fast. That's fast. I remember from the room one, I was from, in. From one, I remember the mistake. I had it in, in the cart ready. I was like, what, what am I buying? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, to go from no to yes in a year is profound. You know, sometimes it takes somebody 68 years to go from no to yes. I, you know, one year is very fast, and I'm very happy for the people that are doing that. The and bit, because the and is difficult. And you're doing many ands with the uh, Vayner Commerce, Vayner FT, this, and so on. Can we talk more about the practicality of the and? Because the or is ide ideology. Ideology on the side. I'm talking about day-to-day -day and of opportunities, and how do you decide on those? Most people are incapable of having as many ands as I do, because most people focus on things that end up not mattering. We only have so much focus. We only have so many hours. We only have so much energy. If you dwell on the little things that are not working, you are incapable of executing on the big things that might work. The reason people struggle with and is they have frameworks of perspective that make them concerned. They hide it a lot of times in perfection. Gary, you don't get it. I'm a perfectionist. I go, you don't get it. You're using the word perfection as disguise for your insecurity. People really struggle with the concept of and because they think maximizing the most out of this thing is what's most important, but they don't realize one of the most important parts of and. There are certain times where I'll have a conversation with Brandon about wine techs for my dad's business that might lead into an insight that I want to replicate on VFRITS. I may go give a conference for doctors where somebody asks me a question that makes me think of something that I want to do with the Sasha group. I may make a piece of content as Gary V that makes me understand that I want to also do that with Ambitious Angel one day. For me, it's a whole spectrum of connecting dots. Most people just go and focus on one dot and go deep, and it's all based on fear and insecurity. My great fortune is that my circumstance and mother put me in an opposite direction. I lack fear. I have all sorts of confidence. It's not because I think I'm special. It's not because I think I'm the best. It's not because I think I'm better than, it's because I know that it is a very singular truth that my reality is based on my reality and I am not concerned about what everyone thinks about my reality. I'm concerned on executing on my reality with the hope that it may impact and help others to create their own reality. It's tough though, know, it's very tough in terms of the perfectionism part, which we all, you know, just a couple of things through the suffer with and you mentioned practice. What's a, the what's a practice that gets us 
away from having this is good, let me leave it for now and move on to something else. This one's gonna get very interesting for me because I'm very passionate about this because it's against a lot of people's popular belief. The practice we need to get comfortable with this is falling in love with losing. The reason I struggle with eighth place trophies is not because I want kids to be upset and lack self-esteem. It's because eighth place trophies create a lack of self-esteem. When you are taught by systems that being eighth is just as good as being first through the first 18 years of your life, when you actually go to the real world, the real world is not interested in how your mommy and daddy want your feelings to feel then. It's real and you have to be prepared. I am surrounded by people I love who have grown up with all sorts of adversity, all sorts of losing the circumstances of their life, what skin tone they were built with, how they lost their parents. They are winning because of their losing. We must, as a society, stop demonizing losing. Why do you think I like the Jets so much? They lose all the time. It's more fun for me to lose. It's better to lose. Losing is good. Losing is how you win later. We must teach children in the early part of their life how to be comfortable with losing. Losing is good. Losing is good. Booing is good. People's judgment on you is good. It's how you build strong. It's how you go to the next place. It makes you capable. That's very different than you thinking you're a loser. People thinking you're a loser when you think you're a winner is great. If you think you're a loser, you've already lost. If you think you suck, if parents have told you you stick, you're not good enough. That's a very different game. But we must change this conversation because what we are living in in our society is a game of a lot of people who aren't happy and then they spend all their energy trying to make other people unhappy from their living rooms and their sofas and on their phones on Twitter. We must stop demonizing losing. We must teach kids to get comfortable with losing. We must teach kids to turn that losing into ambition and focus and tenacity and effort. Why the hell are you gonna practice more if the same trophy goes to you in eighth place than first place? And there's a lot of people that don't like when I talk about this, and I understand why. They're not strong enough because they love their kids so much to see them cry. The greatest thing you could have as a parent is a child that cries when they lose. It means they care. Let's go deeper into the, the, the parenting bit. Deeper than that? Accountability. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the accountability part, which is a strong aspect for you as well. I have kids, they're 11 and 9 now, and I also deal with people who are 40 and 50 who work with me as well, who are also not accountable. What do we do on both tiers with the ant? The accountable ant could end up being the most important character in VFriends. It could. Because as I've been running through society, I, I have found that accountability is a is something people run away from more than I realized. I, am, I, I, I just got so fortunate again where accountability was put on a pedestal in my environment, but I've come to realize most people run away from it. I love the feeling of thinking it's my fault. One of the biggest reasons I've not been able to really enjoy fully this weekend is everything is my fault. The person on Twitter this morning when I was getting ready who says that they were upset and their experience is not as good because they almost got ran over as people were trying to get t-shirts and now it's ruined their recon. That's my fault. Yes, I have a production team. Yes, I have Andy. Yes, I have a team. Yes, I have a thousand people. That's my fault. I approve the decision to make limited edition pieces which creates the emotional mentality that you have to run to the stand. I could have made 7,000 pieces of everything. Nobody would have been running. Accountability is amazing. Accountability is amazing. It leads to happiness. When it's your fault, it's so much more fun. It's very easy to blame your managers, your number two, your number three, your number four, your employees. It's very easy to do that. It's just not true. You're in control. Whoever signs the check is in actual control. And so I take on that responsibility. I'm comfortable with that responsibility. I live within that responsibility. I focus on that responsibility. And I love being accountable. And I know that if we can teach the world the good about accountability, that they will start working on fixing it instead of deciding who they're gonna blame. Society, the weather, their aunt, your boss. We must get out of that place. Accountability is good. We are living in an era right now where everybody will tell you whose fault it is for them not to be happy. The actual answer is, it's your fucking fault. I'll tell you why. 
you can put the work into therapy. You can put the work into exercise. You can put the work into meditation. You can put the work into candor like I had to. You can put in the work. There are very few people on earth, I believe this, maybe my mother excluded, who are more focused on just doing what they're good at and spending no time on what they're bad at. I do that very well. But over the last 15 years of my life, I've put in work to things that don't come natural to me. Candor does not come natural to me on an individual. In this interview, I'm being very candorous. <laughs> the camera's on, I'm the king of candor. In real life, I struggle with it. I continue to struggle with it. In this new form of myself as an operator and a human, I'm still a six in a world where I do a lot of tens. I'm a six, maybe a 5.5, maybe on a good day a seven. But that's a far away from where I was five years ago, being a two and a three and a one. I put in the work. Working out does not come natural to me. I figured it out. I want to live longer so I can keep spitting this knowledge. I put in the work. If I can figure out working out, anybody can figure out anything. And by the way, physical is easier than mental. Me figuring out candor and being in my process makes me triple confident that anybody can figure this out. It doesn't matter how you started. It matters how you finish. I understand that we all have different circumstances. I know. I get it. People spend their lives in my community who first see me looking for some excuse. My dad gave it to me. I got this. I got that. Nobody gave me shit. I fucking did it. I, I, like every other human, had my circumstances. I had lots of good circumstances. Lots of good. But I fucking did it. I worked. I worked. I worked. And I think other people can. And if we continue to give them the appetite and the framework to be able to blame and point fingers instead of pointing thumbs, then they will continue to stay unhappy. And at the end of the day, that's just something I'd like to help people with. Why? Why settle into, well, I'm wrapping it up. I can't do anything about it now. I'm 25, I'm 30, I'm 45, I'm 50, I'm 60. Why? You're 60, you're gonna live for another 40 years with modern medicine. What the doing? You're just, you're halfway home. We're in the early third quarter. The Jets have blown many games early in the third quarter. The last question is about community building. Um, a lot of people in the audience, they were, they're trying their own projects and they hide behind value and so on, but the execution is not there for building communities. What do you feel is missing in terms of taking a solid step towards building a solid community? Two very clear things. The reason most people struggle with building community is almost everybody who says they're building a community is actually trying to build customers. They're not trying to build a community. They want them to buy from, this is my community, by the way, buy this home for me. This is my community, buy this coffee for me. This is my, people are trying to create customers. Building community only looks like one way. You are giving more to them than you want from them. And most people can't do that. Most people aren't trying to build communities. They're trying to use the word. But if you switch, to, if you erase behind the word, it actually says customers. That's number one. Number two, it's very nice that you went to VCon and decided you're gonna build a community. You think you're gonna do that in 36 hours? You think you're gonna build a community in a month? People are like, I'm gonna build a community before I launch my NFT project. I'm gonna launch a Discord and we're gonna launch in 30 days. I'm like, that's cute. I've been doing this for 15 years, 24 seven, 365, giving, 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 giving. Oh, V friends, well, easy for you, Gary. V friends, you already had a community. I earned that community. I earned that community. You weren't f***ing on the flights answering people's question about their problems with their dad and mom and business. You know how many people up here like, you helped me, you helped me, you helped me. That's real community. Everybody wants a community. That's very nice. You have to give. You have to give. You're not entitled to your community. What, you woke up and you're gonna make a penguin and, that, and set a discord and like, I want a community. That's f***ing great. Johnny, what about actually building community? It takes decades to build a meaningful community. People are impatient and people are selfish and then they wonder why is it working down. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Avery Afnini, I'm the president of Vayner NFT. Vayner NFT is a Web3 consultancy focused on helping enterprises navigate this new wave of technology. So I'm sure what you're going through now is what uh, uh, Vayner Media had to go through 
in early social media days of do we need this and why and you know we're too big for this or uh, you know let's wait. So is, is there similar similarity there? I think that's a really good parallel. Um, 10, 12 years ago when Gary started VaynerMedia, social was still very new for brands. And I think what he found there and the reason that he wanted to lean into the world of social for VaynerMedia is they were cautious, but they were very curious. How are these stars being born on Instagram? How are these you know people spending so much time on these apps? Um, so brands were very curious and they wanted help sort of entering the space. With the world of Web3, I think we're having a lot of brands and enterprises super curious about what's happening with these board apes and these V friends and these, you know, conferences that are a Viking stadium of these people who are so passionate around this. And they're curious. They wonder how they can be a part of it. Um, so that's sort of a little bit where we are. It's a little bit of deja vu from 10 years ago with brands and social is now brands in the world of, of Web3 and figuring out if and how they should do a collaboration, they should do an NFT program, they should incorporate this into some of the... Um, efforts they have from their business and marketing. What are the three uh, most difficult uh, concepts that you feel the organizations have to overcome? Because I remember when I was talking with uh, traditional institutions like banks mm -hmm. and insurance companies in the beginning about social media, yeah. and then they're like, Eman, why are you talking to you about Facebook and YouTube? That's what my kids play with for yeah. business, right? So what are the three core concepts that you're coming across in your discussions that you feel these businesses need to get over? I think first is the understanding of why digital asset ownership matters. I think there's a lot of, oh, I could just take a screenshot and save it on my phone and right click save as. Um, and then th that concept of owning something digitally and not mattering um, is still seeping into certain executives' minds. We are fortunate to have incredible partners who have, have started to see the potential and the promise here. Um, but I'll, you know, I have conversations at least 10 times a day of I could take a screenshot of this and save it on my phone. <laughs> um, so explaining why digital asset ownership matters is one concept. The second is cryptocurrency. Right now, the primary method for payment um, in the NFT world is crypto. A lot of enterprises are very nervous about crypto. It's a decentralized financial vehicle. And they're used to be, their business has been built in an entirely centralized fashion. So decentralization scares people a lot. And then I think the third concept is, um, is this understanding of what, what all of this means, right? It's exactly what you just said, where they think it's something for a small group of people. They think it's niche. They think it's um, something that you know, could be a bubble. And um, a big concept that we try to reiterate within the world of, of Vayner, whether that's VaynerX or VFriends or Vayner NFT, is that this is here for the long term. Um, what we're seeing is a fundamental behavior shift to owning things in the world of Web3 digitally. Um, so, you know, I think that's a concept that this isn't a trend or a fad, but rather this is actually the beginning of, of the next iteration of the internet. So I think it's the three things of digital asset ownership mattering, beginning to understand crypto and decentralization, and third, really understanding that this is a long-term development and not, not like the 2022 campaign they should do. Um. For those, for those enterprises who are worried about the success of the project, mm -hmm. is there a framework that you'd recommend where, let's say, you go into this project, if mm -hmm. it doesn't work out, that community, you can move them to your next project or so on. So is there some form of utility that can be transferred from one project to the other, or is that impractical? I think it's practical. I think there's a couple of things I would recommend if you want to have a FUD-proof entry. First is design something that has built-in value, built-in clear value that's clearly communicated, whether that's a year's supply of a product or getting access to a specific event or getting access to specific merchandise, have a very clear and specific utility that you can definitely deliver upon. Second, do an NFT that's either free or an open edition mint. I think a lot of people stress about projects not minting out. There's a very easy way to avoid that with something that's like an open edition that lets the market set the quantity. I think that's really smart. And the third being that like, if it's free, that's an easy way for people to onboard um, free or very, very low cost to onboard people to your project and program and, and ensure that it can be successful. Because I think when something has a free or a low price point, people are, are grateful for it. They're also um, excited to see and be a part of something that isn't necessarily costing them multiple ETH. I think the biggest risk factor is when we see mint prices being really high, the community expects a lot. So if you're going to charge multiple ETH for something, you better be prepared to deliver a lot on the back of that. If you're going to charge zero for something, anything you give is, is a value add. What's low ETH in your understanding? Is it 0 0.3, 0 0.5, something like this? Or, or low, I would just say 0 0.01. 
But, I mean, that low. I could, it could be any pricing, but I think if commercialization isn't your sole objective, then go as low as possible. Allow people to be part of your community. And that way you can build with them. And as the you know price could appreciate or not, um, then you won't have to be as stressed out about that. Um, let's talk about building communities, mm-hmm. right? Uh, not everybody has this big community that Gary Gay has building over a decade, right? Yes. And uh, how would a new brand that starts, how would they, how, what would you recommend that they do to build communities, especially that it's not straightforward, especially if you know, have to go through Discord and other channels that are new to, to different brands and so on. So what would your recommendation be? I think a couple things. First, um, either start building something that had, that serves a unique purpose or like, I would say start small, like start with a group that you understand deeply as a founder or a founding team. So that could be women in Miami, or this could be, you know, Dubai, uh, Dubai influencers, whatever that community that you know really well, start with those people and start, start by solving a problem for them and empowering your community to have aligned incentives. I think if you start small, you start dedicated, you start something that you know, and then that organic growth starts to populate. The best way to grow your community is by adding value to the holders of your project or the members of your Discord. For example, you could be giving out allow list spots, you could give a free ticket to VCon, you could you know, have a special access to an interview that you're doing, but giving value to the people in your community will mean they tell their friends, they tell others, and that's how things grow and grow. Um, I think by creating a forum, whether that's Discord or Telegram or MetaLink or, you know, other or Twitter, um, creating an opportunity for the, for your community to dialogue together and talk about um, something that they have a shared belief in is a tremendous opportunity. And tokenizing that so that they have aligned incentives to the founding team is an incredibly powerful medium to, um, to growth. Um, what about distribution? Uh, in terms of making people aware of the uh, activities, whether NFT or Web3 related. Uh, and uh, it's not easy now to run ads, at least for now, on Instagram and, uh, and yeah. other channels as well. So um, what what would you recommend either? Because the easy part is influencers and a few things here and there, but yeah. practically how, how would that work? Because it's not straightforward. Yeah, I think... Um it's funny, we haven't done a single ad for any of the NFT projects that we've worked on, a paid ad, right? So it's earned, I think, really matters, um, and owned. But you can build something using, whether it's like, okay, maybe one of the founders has a small community, or like they're starting with their friends. Doing collaborations, I think, is probably the smartest way to create awareness and finding a way to do a collaboration that's mutually beneficial to whoever the entrepreneur or new entrance is, and also that that project, um, the the ones they're collaborating with, I think is the smartest way to kind of get people in the game. So whether you're an artist and you can do um, fan art for one of the top projects, maybe that helps, you you know, their community get to know you. I think adding value is the biggest thing that um, entrepreneurs can do um, to get themselves more noticed and uh, help with that distribution that you're asking about. Okay. Uh, thank you, Avery, for, for your practical insight uh, on this, and, and good luck with growing. Uh, uh, I'm sure with the Gary's ecosystem, uh, getting the leads is not difficult, but it's getting them to understand the real value of this and what they really can do. And I'm sure even in sessions where you really feel passionate about this, but the other side might not, they, they don't see it yet. Oh, there's so much, um, you know, I think there's so much doubt and curiosity. I think curiosity is more of a the thing that I see out of people, they might doubt it, but they're also curious. I mean, we've got CEOs from multiple Fortune 500 companies here, and the reason they're here is to learn. They're like, Avery, I wanna learn. I wanna get this, because even if they don't understand it 100% now, they they understand other people feel this passionately, and it's a reason they're gonna take time out of their super busy schedules to learn here, which is pretty amazing. So Maha, I want to talk about Maha Vicon. I saw multiple variations of Maha. I saw the public face of Maha who's on stage and participating and so on. There's another side who Maha, the Gary V whisperer, you're whispering in his ear very specific things. There's a third part is you're running and managing an excellent team as well behind the scenes. So walk me through the, 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 the three different tiers. Yeah, so the first role I had is I ended up uh, on stage a couple times, four times actually. I moderated Deepak Chopra uh, who did an incredible, incredible session where we 
close the session with a guided meditation and all 7,000 people came to a silent and halt. It was wonderful. Very, very powerful. So I did mod that. I moderated Eva Longoria and Hoda Katan, both of who I invited to come here to VCon. I did a panel on Discord, how to be a master moderator of Discord. And then I talked to three incredible artists, Fawocious, Tom Sachs, and Micah Johnson. So it's been incredible to be on stage and to actually engage and moderate and really talk to some of the amazing speakers that came. The second thing is, yeah, just whispering Gary's ear. I'm just like telling him where we're going, what we're doing. You know, I put together his schedule. So what are the key things that he needs to do when he's not on stage? Meeting with partners, doing interviews, talking to some of the sponsors, uh, getting the right uh, photo opportunities. He spent four hours every day doing a selfie station with his fans, making sure that he has time in his calendar to spend it with his family. So he's not always constantly on the go, but really making sure that he's meeting all the speakers and meeting all the guests. So keeping him on a kite run ship, tight run ship to make sure we do that. And then last but not least, I have an incredible, incredible team. Thank you for recognizing them. So I have a team of four people on the press side. They did 55 interviews on the first day. So imagine managing, managing the schedules of all the speakers and all the guests and all the press needs and the logistics of the rooms and how we put together every daily recap of what happened, putting out press releases and photos and turn around the videos. It's an incredible operation. And these four women just killed it. I'm really proud of what they did. But I also have a team of people working with the partners and sponsors. So we were in charge of bringing all the activations to VCon. So NFT Pepsi land, the flea market from rally, uh, the cameo pass, uh, chill out zone, uh, the gaming lounge. Like we were in charge of working with the clients to build a really unique experience. So when people come here, they have fun. So I have a sponsorships team, partners team. That's like making sure the partners are happy, making sure everything's set up the way it was supposed to be, making sure the brand is on point, uh, troubleshooting any logistics. Uh, did breakfast get turned over correctly? Did we clean up the space properly. So I have a team of people also working on that. And then the third team I have is a talent team. So managing Gary, Gary's like a talent, but also we were in charge of managing Deepak's schedule, managing Huda's schedule, interviews, meetings, making sure that they meet all the right people, get all the right press. And so putting together detailed plans for all of them as well. Let's talk about the team building effort on this. So those who I met were Lara, Beth and Maria, excellent under pressure, very, very well handled. So, because um, I hire for myself and for my clients as well, and I look for culture, you know, because uh, culture comes from home when they come in. Uh, you can teach skill set, but not culture. I also look for how they're able to handle changing priorities as well. I'm curious about your process um, and how you look at uh, choosing somebody. And then, is there a lot of process that goes into, you know, if for managing a talent, scenario one, you do this, scenario two, you do that. If somebody asks for an interview, you follow these steps. So talk to me, please, about two things. One, the hiring process. Second, uh, if, if there are systems and processes that you put in place for that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, this team that delivered this execution, I just trusted them. I put my faith in them to do their work, and they did. They over-delivered and over-exceeded my expectations. So the hiring process for them is simple. Like, I really look for the character of the person. I look for their values. I don't hire for skills. I hire for the human first and then the skills can follow. So that's really the main, main strategy of all these people. And that why I'm really grateful that they're my team. As I told a couple of them the first night, it's the first time I have a team that I can trust that just takes over the reins and runs with it. And I'm really proud of them. Um, with a huge event with VCon, there are thousands of small moving parts, right? Yeah. What are three uh, obstacles that you felt that you really overcame well in, 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 and very quickly? Well, the first obstacle we were facing is how to deal with COVID. Like, are we going to have this event? Are we not going to have this event? Are we going to, I mean, Omicron happened in like December and January and everyone over the Christmas holidays had COVID. We're like, oh my God, we've invited all these speakers. We paid for a venue. We're talking to sponsors. We're trying to sell during COVID an event that might not happen if it gets you know, bad because of in-person events. Like, so that was a big one we had to navigate and we were just like, we'll follow the rules and see how people are doing and make sure that we create the best context for people to get together in a safe and healthy way. So that was one of them that we had to kind of overcome. Um, I can't really think off the top of my head of a couple others that you, we have, but just like in general, like dealing with 
all the moving parts of like the talent, the speakers and the programming, make sure we have the right diversity, the right types of people, different categories from celebrities to athletes. The schedule was solid on, you know, there were small delays within minutes, not huge. Uh, and in such a large scale event, that's very difficult to turn around. Everything ran on time. Everything ran on clockwork. You know, it was incredible. I mean, even the only thing at the welcome party that had like the lines were really, really long for people to get in, but it was like the first time. But other than that, it went smooth since then. Um, I want to talk more about uh, uh, something in your content that, that you talk about uh, related to um, how people enjoy what they're doing and the work that they're doing. Because the vibe I got here uh, is that if you're fortunate enough to be in a space that you like, like here, Web3, anything Web3 and crypto and so on, plus the entertainment piece, this is so much fun to be happy to just be, right? So um, can we talk more about that? Because you touch on that in your con online content as well. Yeah, I mean, it's so special to be here. I think one of the things I've noticed as I walk around and people talk to me, they're just asking me, like, it's just so friendly here. People care about each other so much. And this all the values of kindness and empathy. And, and you know, Gary noticed on the first day when there was a big line for the merch, everyone rushed to get the merch and people were pushing and shoving to get merch. And it was almost going to get like, everyone really wanted the merch. Gary, in his opening keynotes at the tone of like, hey, we're about kindness. We're about being patient pandas. So really be empathetic with each other and be kind with each other. And the rest of the event, there were no incidents whatsoever like that. People were waiting in line for an hour and a half up at the happy hour. Nobody complained about it. Everyone was happy. Everyone was being patient pandas. People were waiting in line for hours to get a selfie with Gary. So it kind of talks a lot about the values of the people that are here and the culture that has been cultivated. Um, I've noticed that you're putting up others here, right? So uh, Smashy came in last minute, you helped. Uh, Nadine from uh, Art, Art yeah. Egypt also was here as well and many others that you know as well. So you put an active effort in putting up others and creating opportunities for that. Yes. And I've seen that in other uh, activities that you've done. So tell me more about that because that takes, that's difficult, right? Because yeah. you have to find the right person, you have to be comfortable, you have to make sure that they, they do it well and you have to do it systematically. So walk me through that because it's a skill set that you have to practice. Yeah, just it's finessing, making sure you're creating value. Like I know how important it is you came all the way from Dubai to be here. I have to make sure that you get the right value, meet the right people. By the way, Gary said his interview with you was incredible. He's like, that was fine. I didn't hear it. I wasn't, th I mean, I walked in and I know you did it, but I'm just saying like, I knew if we can create a connection for people and add value to them, that something good's going to come out of it. So you have to just have that judgment, like what's worth the effort to get something squeezed in last minute? Are you really going to get that power? And it obviously to paid off. Uh, and, and with the interview with, with Gary, uh, because I know him so well, I know his content so well, I've been, been keeping in touch with him so well. My questions were not, you know, what's an NFT and what's Web3? So we went into things that, that uh, and of course it's, it's him. He, he, adds, he adds so much. And he, what I really like about him is that he's with you, right? 100% mm -hmm. all the time. It's not like there are many things that are happening around him. He can, he can lose focus uh, for a second. My last question for you was more from a, a, a woman's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing up an 11 year, year old daughter uh, and I always look for women who are accomplished in their career. And I think about, okay, upbringing and things like this and so on. So what are a couple of things, one or two things that you felt have made a difference in your upcoming, whether it's adversity or not, yeah. that made you feel comfortable, you know, that helped, helped you now? I grew up in an environment where I was in a family of educators. So I was always having to learn. And lifelong learning was a value that my parents instilled in me, that you always need to be learning. You're just, when you go to school, it's not when you finish your education, you're just getting started. So having the humility to learn something new, like Web3, having the humility to take on new industries and marketplaces that are very difficult to understand, have the empathy and patience with yourself to figure it out, and are really just focus on investing in yourself. If you invest in yourself, take the time to learn new things, good things will come out of it. My last, last question is combining the Middle Eastern part of Maha and the American part of Maha, right? So Minnesota, it's my first time in Minnesota and so many people have been here for the first time. I saw you teaching a DJ yesterday and how to, how to belly dance as well, <laughs> right? So you're combining the two, walk me through that. Um, first of all, this is taking place in my hometown. So it's a very personal thing for me that we that all these people are in Minneapolis for the first time, Minnesota for the first time, like Eva Longoria is like, why are we going to Minnesota? Like, it's just like, I really happy that she's saying the word Minnesota and she's here because of this event. So I think that's really personal for me. It combines my personal passion of my home state, my personal passion of my work, 
my passion and my work with Gary um, and my job. So it was a really, really like enlightening and like warming moment for me. Secondly, you know, I talked about on stage with Huda and Eva. I have been approached by so many Egyptians that are here at this event. It's incredible. And yesterday, it was the end of the day. We've had a very long couple of days last on our feed and so some guy was trying to teach me salsa and I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna teach you how to belly dance. And actually it was a really fun moment and just got to show my roots and cultures in different ways. Thank you, Maha, uh, for your energy and your activity. Thank you for having so us here. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ayman, thank you. Hi Nadine Salma. I'm Nahki now on Art Egypt. What you're trying to do is you're trying to take artists who today struggle in Web2. They struggle with their Instagram, with their website, and so on, and you're taking them a deeper step into Web3. The image I have in my mind is cartoons with, with Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. You put them in a rocket and they zoom and crash. So how are you helping them zoom and not crash? So uh, I think it's a simple uh, answer. <laughs> Because actually, to, to start with, uh, we have physical installations. And what happened in Forever Is Now, our last exhibition in October, was that there was a huge online impact. So the digital world really made a difference. So instead of having half a million people physically see the exhibition, we had over two billion people see the exhibition. So imagine if these artworks are on a digital platform. How many people will see it? Um, so it makes it much more accessible to the whole world. And she can answer the, the answer <laughs> regarding the, the, so, uh, the runner. <laughs> so basically, we just launched our first NFT um, uh, project on Foundation. It's very exclusive. It's uh, eight NFTs. Forever is, now. Uh, forever is now, exactly. So we turned the physical artworks into digital artworks, and these uh, are uh, these were launched two days ago. And uh, thanks to Nadine's uh, talk tonight, uh, there are a huge following on Foundation <laughs> straight after. So it really made a huge difference. We were in collaboration with all the Forever Is Now artists, uh, most of them, and they're uh, they're all. Uh, very looking forward to being a part of uh, the new Web3 digital world. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this project because I got my start as digital advisor helping artists. So what I used to do is after you know a nice show, I used to walk up and say, I like your work. How can I you know, say up to date with you? They're like, uh, take my email or whatever. It was like Instagram, Twitter, at the time, Instagram, yeah, Twitter, website, Facebook. So I saw ongoing that this is an issue, and then I started to help out artists and so on. And then it was difficult to scale, uh, uh, and I looked at it differently. So, but 15 years later, they still struggle with their Instagram, their Twitter, their website. So how big of a jump is this to them? Do they have the attitude of saying, look, Nadine, just take my artwork, do whatever, do your Web3 thing, and just uh, send me the money? Uh, so it depends on, on the artist, actually. But what you say is, is very true and it's very important. And jumping from Web 2 to Web 3 <laughs> is also a leap. Uh, but again, it's very important. And I think we have also an issue in, in our region is that... Uh, one issue with, in terms of art, only one? One, one of the issues <laughs> is also it's good that you, you just said that, that you, that you would help artists to get out there. A lot of artists don't even have a proper portfolio, don't have a proper Instagram account. So how would you see their art? How would you know about them? And at the end of the day, if they just exhibited one physical space, how many people will see their art? So it is very important to have an, an online existence. And I think um, this is what the digital world is, is helping do. Uh, Salma, walk us through the flow. I have a great artist. She draws very well. Uh, do I send her over? Do I introduce her to, 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 to Forever Is Now? What happens? And uh, you look at portfolio, you accept all or you educate some or you present them, you're part of the percentage. Walk us through that. Well, so basically we uh, select our artists very, very carefully. Uh, some you meet in exhibitions, some you hear about, some you see their work online, you want them to be part of your exhibition. But at the same time, you know, all the artworks 
of Forever is now are custom made. So they have to be in dialogue with the Egyptian uh, civilization, the ancient Egyptian civilization. So, you know, you pick the artist uh, and then you they submit a, a proposal and then it goes through a whole process until it's finally accepted and curated into the space physically, digitally, you name So it. let's say it's accepted. Then what? What do you do? And, and do you just wait and get an email saying, okay, you're, you're tokenized? Oh, you mean turning them from physical? What's the, pro what's the process? Yeah, I mean, look, look, so let's say an artist does a physical piece. You're like, let's go into Web3, let's digitalize it, create an NFT for it. And then you start talking to them about it, how they can transform their physical artwork into digital. So this is a whole process, you know, you're, maybe you're dealing just with the artists, maybe you're dealing with designers that are helping the artists, helping the company to make the physical into digital. And then you select the platform you want to distribute the, the exhibition in. And then you create a collection for the exhibition on Web3, uh, Egypt in collaboration with the artist. But you tokenize and you do everything for them, right? We do everything from A to Z. Uh, you have your own tech team, you have a third party, you have a platform. Yeah. What, 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 how did you implement this? Yeah. So for a foundation, we, there's foundation um, websites already there. But what we did w with the artist is that we came up with an idea with the artist, how we want to make the physical into digital. And we have an in-house designer that helps us digitalize the artworks. So we go back to the artist and if they like the idea, you like the design, we go ahead, we tokenize, we mint, we get everything sorted, smart contracts, everything, and then it's minted onto foundation and it's live. Uh, my last question to either of you is the problem of self-expression. For me, I find it unusual that an artist, because what all they do, whether it's sculpture, painting, whatever it is they do, it's self-expression. They can express themselves so well in their art, but when it comes to self-expression in terms of getting people to know them, in terms of just letting know who they are, I'm not saying self-promotion extreme, out, uh, uh, out revert sort of element, just getting to know the basics of making sure of people know them. They do the, they self-express so poorly. They've always have been like this. Why? Because, and I, I mean, I believe it's important for an artist to have an art, an, an advisor. Uh, or a publicist or someone that would take care of this side of, of, of their career. Because an artist should have the peace of mind and the time to create and not have the pressure of them going and getting uh, press or, you know, having their Instagram account managed. So a lot of people, a lot of platforms, a lot of galleries would do that for the artists. Um, it's important. And again, uh, in Egypt, for instance, through the exhibitions we, we do, because we do big public exhibitions in historical spaces, and they're open to the public. They're completely open. It's not in a small, confined space, but you go to Shari uh, al-Mu'izza, for instance, which is in historic Cairo, and you see artwork in, in the locations, and it's out there for the public for free. So this is really important, and it's important because... Um, we manage things in a 360 degree. Uh, so as a curator, what I try to do is have all the aspects there, make sure that there are collectors that attend the exhibitions, make sure that there's enough public to come see the exhibition, make sure that there's enough media, because without you guys, nobody would hear anyone's story. So it's really important to have this uh, figured out and done professionally. It's not easy, but it's something we have to do. One thing I'd add, it's something I'm asking both of you to do, is add more, as much utility as you can. Because I look at all of these artists and they treat it like uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collectible item. If you like me and my work, you collect it. And the are not like this, right? So pumping in as much utility. I saw you have uh, invitations to things and so on in, in, your, in your utility, but just pump as much as possible to that. So uh, artists who want to join you, where do they go? What do they do? Uh, get in touch with us either on Instagram, Ardegypt, or info at A-R-T-D-E-G-Y-P-T-E. -E. Do they need to be from Egypt? Nope. We work with uh, international artists as well. And they could be painters, sculptures, whatever? Uh, yes. Uh, we have different... That's not a solid yes. No, no, but we have uh, different exhibitions around uh, the year, not just one. We prefer working with installations and sculptures 
uh, because we do a lot of outdoor exhibitions. But yes, we do work with the multidisciplinary artists. Artists, if you're looking to get into the space, the help that they're giving you from the description today is clear. If you want to do this on your own, it's going to take you a while, but don't treat it like, oh, I'll email it to these guys and let them worry about it. Either you're in or you're out. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and that was Spashi's special VCon coverage, showing you behind the scenes of the latest in Web3 and pop culture. And that summarizes Smashy's behind the scenes of how VCon is set up, what does it mean for you as a consumer and person who's interested in Web3, and what you can do from a tech, art, and business perspective. Look for more content from Smashy about Web3 and crypto and pop culture. VCon is fun. I really wish that you can find yourself in an industry that you really like, and you have fun doing this. So if you're into Web3 and technology and pop culture and music, and want to do this for the next six to 10 years, VCon is where you need to be at.